So we have a weekly routine reminder about Tuesday, the 13th of April. <laughs> Do we need to replace that with something else? So I'm filling in for Shweta while she's out. Um, I know the um, code freeze was moved to the 11th. Um, technically, this last week was supposed to be the last week of testing, but I think it's okay to continue for next week since we've got code freeze moved. Either way, we've got all these 11 P0s remaining. I checked that this okay. morning. So how do we want to tackle that? I think the ask nope. in the last TSC meeting was the working group leads to review, right? Yeah. yeah. Most of those are already assigned. Um, I've got one that I'm working on. Mandar has some that he's working on. Mitch has some that he's working on. Um, yeah, we, we just need to complete them at this point. Do you need anything from TSC? Um, so I think there's two that are currently unassigned that we had no volunteers for at the work group leads meeting. Um, I'll go back through that and figure out what those two are, but. <clears throat> okay, I guess this is gonna get discussed at the, the leads meeting tomorrow. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it'll get brought back up. And the release health is updated as well. So we still have four blockers, um, seven P zeros and seventeen P ones. We can look at the blockers. And the blockers are looks like they have owners and they're getting work done. Yep. Yeah, all, all of these have owners. So I added this item to the agenda as well. Um, for previous Istio releases, we had um, community managers write these, um, kind of a marketing spin to them, and um, they got linked to in various places and that sort of thing. Um, currently, we don't have a community manager as far as I'm aware. Um, not sure who should be writing the uh, 1.10 release announcement, but looking for volunteers. Anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> Silence means nobody nobody on this call is volunteering. We can talk about this maybe in uh, steering. How much time do we have to resolve this? The release is on May 18th. OK. Let me, let me uh, copy this over to steering. Thanks. if the rest of TOC is okay with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Is this for the release uh, announcement blog that Dan Cerulli used to write? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Anyone have other topics? Is this the, the pre-release lull in topics? That seems to be coming tr traditional. Or is Monday killing the agenda? Released. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if Monday is making people less awake. Or Shweta's on vacation then, so 
Nothing's getting at. Nothing's getting at it. So Sam uh, and I were having some discussion on the revision upgrade. Sam, do you think it would be good to update the TOC on this? Because I think it's a pretty important topic. On uh, what specific what specific point there? Um, about the like the the validation webhook resolution for this upcoming release, and also the tag portion. Uh, how are we going to educate people to do tag? as the experimental commands? Right, yeah, so the, the tag stuff, uh, unfortunately, doesn't doesn't fix the validating webhook issue. Um, we had a proposal for kind of uh, introducing an API to fix the uh, which revision handles validation, um, and that's kind of stagnated, and I don't think we have a good way forward on that proposal. Sam, why um, is it stagnated? I'm, I'm curious if there's something we could do to help. Uh, yeah, so there's a doc and there's, there's just uh, feedback that I'm having a hard time resolving. Um, pretty much, there, there's a lot of valid feedback there and uh, it's, it's the default revision proposal, by the way. Um, that was going to control which revision handled both Istio injection enabled, uh, inject the injection, uh, the default injectors, mm -hmm. and um, also which one handles validation, which is the harder problem, probably. Uh Hey, Carson, do you have any idea how to unblock Sam? Well, the problem is not unblocking him. Is the problem is we don't have a solution that, that, that doesn't regress in, in some area. I mean, it's it's uh, the, the, some ways uh, are possible, but that will mean that uh, each STOD instance will, will have more permissions, require more permission to install, which is something that we certainly do not want to do. And um, so basically, we lack a good solution that satisfies, you know, that, that is moving us forward. Uh, the current status quo is that users will have to have a, a default installation, which I don't think it's, it's completely horrific. Um, that was a requirement before, and it's something that we want in the future to have one more trusted than others. So maybe it's not a problem that we actually need to solve uh, urgently, because the definition of the problem is I can install Istio without having a default revision. Well. Maybe we can wait a bit until we have a solution for that. Is there a, is there a doc or something that covers this? Yes, there is, there is, there is at least uh, there, are, there are two docs. Yes. Can we link it in the yeah. notes? And uh, for next environment, I have a, a doc that that uh, that is to kind of further <laughs> refactor the, the base, so we have a bit more flexibility for advanced users on how they configure this kind of stuff. Basically, the proposal is to move the validation out of the charts and have it as a completely separate standalone step where the user is actually explicitly specifying what validations they want and not because the problem is we, we have the spaghetti you know charts and then installs that we have and um with with revision and everything else it's getting more and more difficult to 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 hack it to to do duct tape it basically Yeah, yeah so one, um, sorry, go ahead, Lynn. I was just going to say I linked the doc in, so if you, you guys want to open it. So basically, I, what I think it would be confusing is that we did ask a user to kind of install Istio without revision as a starting point. Uh, what's confusing is in the revision tag a documentation, we kind of showcase to user, hey, this is your production revision of where you are today and then this is how you move to a newer revision so so we kind of also tell people you should revision your old version and then this is how you upgrade to a new revision i, I just feel like the best recommendation wasn't super clear and as a community it would be great if we can you know have clear guidance to the user whether they should start with a revision in the first place or whether they should just always do default but then later on they can always do revision once they met the requirement of the first release was the default uh, uh one thing I'm so, so, oh, sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Yeah, so uh, installing with uh, with an initial revision, that should work with the fix here. 
And one thing we could do actually is in the installer, just create um, an Istio D service and then installing with a revision will just work. Um, the problem there is uh, it won't work for Helm install because it'll be a fix that's uh, unique to our installer. And also we won't have an API after that on how to change which revision is, is the, the, the handles validation. That's that's kind of the problem. I think we should make that change though, so that it just works as documented. But uh, in reality, the root problem is that we are relying on install hacks. I mean, Helm template hacks, and uh, there are all kind of restrictions that Helm places. Istio Cattle has a different set of restrictions. So we are in a situation where we're you know doubling down on everything must be done to Helm templates and working around instead of taking a more you know drastic saying that hey if you want to control the version and you know some some things need to be controlled to api basically so you need to use cube cattle apply or you need to use a separate step where you configure with uh, you know easy to install everything all in once doing the, the default which you know works perfectly fine but if you if you want to do advanced things you should use some tools to control what revision i mean it's not not to bundle the validation or hook it with uh with the templates basically that's kind of the more deeper, deeper fix, basically. So, are you agree with what Sam was proposing? Sorry, I wasn't clear. Uh, I, I I mostly agree, but but with with, with the exceptions that eventually we want this uh, this uh, step of configuring the validation to be taken out of the base, basically, to be a second a standalone step. So, if you are a user who's using revisions to have a safe update. You need to have Istio Cattle set something and, and, and or, or you know apply a YAML that will control the validation and possibly the mutating webhook for the default. Instead of relying of, on on um, on templates and if else and, and kind of spaghetti in the install to to kind of decide what what goes where. So you want to split between a, an install state and an activated state. Yes. So uh, you you do the initial install and after that you 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 basically operate you you change configs you change labels but it's not really an install operation it's an it's an you know kind of management operation. Yeah, but I thought that that was the the tech command that Sam implemented implemented right in this release is for that specific purpose right after installation yes. and config whichever one is my active tag. And, and 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 that's perfect. I mean, that, that that's where 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 we are completely aligned, and and I think we 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 are on the same page. The only problem is the actual implementation of that right now is still based on some hacks in the template, basically, and that okay. creates some problems with the, with the install. Just rip the bandaid, do it <laughs> with you know. Uh, next environments we can discuss it in depth. I mean, there is one document, and we can also revisit this document as well. It's, so I mean, I, I guess you know, if there's a top level question for the TOC, is, is the question is, is it okay for revision based installs to be two step instead of one? More like three, three or four steps, but uh, yes. I, I mean, the, for basic install, it's still one step. I mean, is it nobody? I mean, I know yeah, that no, it's no, no, strong. No. Yeah. Well. I, there's Istio Cuddle install on Helm install, right? Yep. And both of them will be single command effectively to, to do a beginner install. So there is no concern here. I mean, it's a default install. But once you start to do upgrades and operate and do more advanced stuff and do revision based, if you want zero downtime and everything else, then you'll have some commands to run and, and maybe you know, take a bit longer to, to do the upgrade. Maybe not instantaneously, but maybe it will take a day or two or a week to, to kind of roll out each component uh, at a safe pace. Yeah, by the way, there is also the CA migration document that, that, you know, the features that was introduced, which is also kind of require a bit more fine grain control and, and, and you know, kind of staging of operations. I mean, it's not something you can do in one step, a magic command and everything, uh, everything works. Okay. Uh, I think I heard someone with some feedback, but it was almost inaudible. Yeah, I heard it too. Maybe they want to type in the chat window.
So I think what, one thing I'm kind of missing here is how we want this to work. Like, you know, the, the doc that basically lays out what this should look like at the end. Like, what, what do we want the experience to actually be? Because we're kind of, I, I think we're doing point, point fixes towards something, but it isn't clear what we're trying to get to. Is that something environments can put together and say, okay, here's, here's what, we, what we want it to look like when all is said and done? Uh, yes, I, I, I was trying to do it in, in, in the doc, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a section focused on this particular. Is, is that what the usage example is supposed to be, the thing that we're looking at right now? Yeah. The, the usage is mostly right. It's actually details of how it is going to, to be activated and implemented. It's, it's, it's still uh, debated. Yeah, I, so and I think. Go ahead, Lynn. So I was just going to add, and and I think specifically for one nine, uh, one ten, uh, I think we also want to know if what Sam was mentioning is reasonable. Well, we would um, either ask a user to create the SDLD service manually through um, maybe kubectl commands, or maybe we'd make a change to SDLcuddle to take care of that action for the user so user doesn't have to do that extra step um, so that, that that's a question you know just to ask uh, the general toc for feedback because uh, today you know like i mentioned to sam if you look at that warning message i stare at that message for like a couple of minutes i couldn't make sense of it it wasn't super clear to me. I'd rather not display that warning message and just tell user what to do. I, I, I think both is probably the right answer because you're, you're talking about this, this warning message, right? Then, yeah, right? due to a bug. Yeah, in the creation. Yeah. So uh, I think I think the, the, the answer my, my answer is, is is both. I mean, Istio Cutter should definitely do this, but we should also have the documentation saying you can also create this Istio this service, or apply this validation web basically to to to, to expose to the user what actually Istio Cutter is doing in case they want to do it through 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 Cube Cutter. Some people are more comfortable with CI/CD applying Cube Cutters than they are comfortable with running Istio Cutter in in a CI/CD system. Yeah, they were needed for Helm too, right? So Helm user would just have to manually do that. To, to apply a cube cutter, yes. I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of that's recommended in the warning as well, right? The uh, create a service called SDOD using this service as a template. I, I The signaling is really bad though for 110, especially for our recommended install. I agree that. Uh, I think that we should move forward with a change to the installer and just get rid of this message because it's not relevant. It, I, th I think that's probably the right way forward myself. Okay, so what are the what are the follow ups here? Anything? I would say fix this doc first of all, because if if Lynn is it's not clear to Lynn, it's probably not going to be clear to any of our users. So it'd probably make that uh, better, and then change the installer. And I think that can probably make it into well, it's kind of late for one ten, I guess. So, but uh, for one ten, we can we can put a, a documentation with a, with a sample YAML, just like we are doing for gateway injection, by the way, where we are also moving towards. People apply a YAML and then they get the result, uh, and 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 have an example either of service or the web validating webhook or both because both of them are are useful to document. So this is how you create a, a validating webhook to point to whatever you want. This is how you create a service if you want to redirect ISTOD and and uh, you know more YAML less magic. And it sounds like this is this is a one ten thing. Is there a long term plan where we, you know, end up with an installer that's less confusing, or an installation model here where, like, with Helm, it's just really straightforward. For example, to change which one's the default. 
I, I think that's what some are saying. I mean, for 111, he can, I mean, we can add the, the Istio cattle to make it, if for people who want to only use Istio cattle to be able to do this, the same thing from Istio cattle. Well, but I, I, I was specifically was saying, I specifically meant for Helm, like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, telling users that the way to use our software is like, you know, create these services and manually move them around and do all this stuff doesn't seem very. Well, with, with Helm, I mean, the, the, the whole idea is that we document what you need to put in, in a Helm template or in whatever you are using. For Gateway, for example, the current plan for Gateway is that you will have a YAML file where you have some, some basic template and you apply it with Helm, with kubectl with whatever you want. We do injection, so it's 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 completely automated. All the complicated parts are automated. Uh, same here. I mean, we document. Hey, put this validation webhook in your whatever you want. Helm in your own. I mean, it's not under our control. It's under the control of the user. They have a Helm chart where they have gateways. They have validating webhooks. They specify whatever they want to configure Istio. I, to me, that feels a little bit too much like asking the user to figure out how to put all the pieces together rather than helping them do it. Um, right. I'm yeah. not not happy with that as the solution. Well, networking is moving in the same direction. I mean, join me to comment on the gateway. Maybe. I mean, gateway is understandable because it's like you're creating a new instance of a thing, so you should have a YAML representing it. That's fine, and I think it's okay to have a YAML representing your to install, right? Like that's how the installers model. So I, like I, th that's what kind of why I'm asking for you know a doc that describes this mostly in user examples, so we can kind of take a look and see if there's improvements we can make to the experience while keeping the same flexibility and power. Okay, one, one thing that TSC would would help a lot is is to clarify the, the some 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 goals and and kind of priorities here. Uh, one discussion, we, we, we recurring discussion, is uh, reducing the, the permission and operating without cluster-wide uh, permission. I mean, by being able, is the operator, I can you know change your configuration and do stuff without having a cluster admin uh, privilege. Uh, I so far, my understanding was that it is a goal to have lower permissions and and and, and be able to do that, and cluster-wide resources like CRDs, validating webhook, mutating webhook are kind of part of this problem why, why we're having all this confusion. If the QSC say, hey, no problem, cluster admin is perfectly fine, it opens up a lot of options in, uh, in this area. Cl cluster admin for the the person installing a control plan, is that what you're talking about? Uh, person who operates a control, because there is one thing to to to, to change mesh config, to, to, to change access log to something else, or to, to move to a different version of Istio D1, or to, 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 to shift 20% of your version. And it's a completely different thing to for that person to have ability to you know own the cluster basically, to, to be able to insert a modify a webhook. So basically all the pods, including Kubernetes, are redirected to, to his own hook and, and inject magic uh, Bitcoin mining, basically. Or still or secrets or whatever. I mean it, 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 it's it's the role. I mean is there is a cluster admin who owns a cluster and then there is a person who operates PSTOD just like a regular uh, without, without having superpowers. Do we have feedback from users that those need to be separated? Uh, well, we don't have a lot of feedback from users that security is should do. I mean, it's kind of an implicit. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone said, uh, hey, I don't want to, to run cluster. I mean, there, there, there are some multi-tenant requirements where, where you know, tenants Definitely do not want to have to be all of them cluster admins because that defeats the purpose. Right, but is that a case for Istio, Kofton, right? I mean, like take CNI, for example, right? How, how would an Istio administrator, like an Istio administrator couldn't update CNI? And, right? Yep. So, right, there so there some... if there was a revision that required an update to CNI, they couldn't do it without the cluster admin permission. Uh, True, but uh, CNI is, is in the in the first bucket of cluster wide. Uh, so CNI, CRDs, uh, uh, cluster roles, cluster role bindings. That's in the the the, the trustworthy permission. Uh, keep in mind there is there is you know, multi cluster external ISTOD. There are all kind of, of situations where where uh, the ISTOD operator itself maybe it's a service provider. It doesn't necessarily need to have full control over the cluster, and, and the owner of the cluster may delegate. Hey, manage my my pods. 
and do ECO stuff with uh, with uh, you know inject sidecars and whatever in specific pools, but I don't want to trust you to have full permission to control over the entire thing. So I don't think we've had a discussion in TOC where we said that that was important to allow uh, allow that class of user, right? Like that doesn't have cluster admin but still wants to install Istio. At least I haven't heard that. So even for uh, external Istio D, we, we want external Istio D to have cluster admin on all clusters that are using that service. That simplifies a lot of things, to be honest. I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> I think somebody needs to have cluster admin to configure Istio, even if they're using external Istio D. Right? Like, that's the case with CNI, because CNI is not external. Yep. Right, and the webhooks are not external. Yeah, yeah. but the, the idea was to separate, I mean, the, the cluster quite the resources are one person, one role, who is a cluster owner, and then EastUOD is another thing, which is uh, the external company or, or, or external service or whatever that is doing the, the control plane. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, do you know any real users that actually have that separation? Right, that's that's kind of what I was asking. We know Helm, for example, strongly recommends that you don't even have ability to, to set labels on namespaces. We know that there are companies that are doing multi-tenant where users, you know, just don't have and they lock down basically the user. JK Autopilot is, <laughs> is 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 you know restricting what uh, what the Istio or what any any application can do. I don't think right, they but not it would allow you to install Istio though. So I've never seen anyone split as aggressively as we are proposing here, yep. nor ask for it in Istio. So I'm a so bit concerned that we're just solving problems with, that maybe don't exist. With JK Autopilot, how would you do this? Because as far as I know, they strict, they, and, and, and not only that, I mean, any, most many security conscious uh, uh, clusters do lock down what you can install as cluster one. They don't give you permission to install CMI. Right, but that's, that's, but that's, quite easy right, but, that, but that's a blanket issue. That's not a separation issue, Dustin, right? It's not like an Istio autopilot, you can have two different roles because both roles can't install CNI, right? Uh, look, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, if the TOC decision is that this is not a requirement, not a priority, then again, everything becomes super simple. We don't even need two templates. I mean, we can just have, you know, Put everything. Everything is running as cluster. A lot of things are super simple. So that that that's. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I'll be very happy to to have this restriction and wall removed. Yeah, I think that that would be my preference because it seems like we could, like, we can still do that split as an advanced configuration option if users need it. Uh, uh, splitting but, it up, it's it's hard. I mean, uh, it's easy to put them together and 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 and, and remove all. <laughs> it took a lot of effort even to get to the step where where, where we have the CRT separated and uh, and to have. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very hard work to to separate to, to secure stuff. I mean, that's yeah. So so the separation the separation for um, like external control plane the operator of the control plane versus the operator like within the cluster. So that that separation makes total sense to me, but having this additional split within a cluster doesn't like I don't see the use case for that because um, I think anyone who's anyone who's installing Istio in a cluster kind of should be cluster admin. Uh, if if they install it cluster wide and, and but, but there are use cases where you know you may not want everything in the cluster to exist you and and to be you know it's a walled garden concept that you know do we actually. Have so do we have examples of that, right? Is this a theoretical concern or is this an actual concern? So the way we do it at Red Hat is our operator runs as cluster admin and CNI runs as cluster admin, but the person creating that control plane does not have to be cluster admin. They just create the resource and the operator goes and installs it. Yeah, I think that's the operator, the operator is cluster admin and the operator is acting on their behalf. Yep. Right, whereas Helm doesn't have that intermediary. Yeah. And yeah. And 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 if we if we go the ways that uh, we're thinking, where where basically Istio the operator has full permissions of a cluster, a lot of things that you are doing may not work so nicely when Istio starts to do you know more stuff. You know, the templates and uh, probably personally use your own templates. So probably don't care. So that's fine. 
So yeah, so I think I think the question here is really then if we look at this just on the Helm template side, do we need a split in our Helm templates based on the permission level of the person running the templates? Or is it okay to say, hey, you need you need kind of full permissions and here's the simplified template and you just run that? So if, if that's a the conclusion, then Istio D can create the validating webhook and, and you know, if it installs with defaults and it creates a validating webhook, creates validating webhook, we don't even need Istio cut and it's, it's completely fully automated. Zero effort for anyone. If you drop security, everything is easy. Well, so you're saying make Istio D more powerful. That's not what I was saying, right? I was just saying like one, simplify the install experience, but make the user running the install experience have to have more permission. Istio already has permission on mutating webhooks, so it's, it's not uh, any change really. We are trying to remove it basically. So, so, yeah, so I, part... thought we trying, I thought we were trying to get rid of that. Uh, well, yeah, that was part of the reason. I mean, the, the whole separation of cluster was the reason we are trying to remove the mutating webhook permission from Istio D. But if you are saying that so, no, no, uh, no customer wants it. I want to make sure we're not conflating two things, right? So the permissions that Istio D runs with, right, is a different question than the permissions that the administrator who's installing needs like they're related because if you're installing SDOD with a bunch of permissions then you need permissions but so like that to me that's a that's a harder question whether we say oh let's just give SDOD cluster admin right like that seems to me at least a lot more dangerous uh, that's the case today. So it really does have equivalent of cluster admin. Why yes, but, but you, you mentioned that that was a, the specifically the thing we were trying to fix, right? True, but with the assumptions that customers want to have this model where where uh, Istio is untrusted, basically, it's, it's an external component that has you know limited permission of the cluster. Sure, it's a, that's, that's, like it's not a priority. As Sven, no, no, as Sven, Sven said, right? There's a difference between the person and this DoD. Maybe. The person is the one doing the install. Right. Yeah. Right. Like I'm okay. I'm okay requiring the installer, the person, to be super user, whereas I'm not okay with this duty necessarily having to be super user. Right. I see. That would need a lot of thinking. I mean, how to to do this kind of fine detail because. And, so and by the way, I'm also fine with the. The operator, like just like Red Hat, right? Like the operator model where the operator has elevated permissions, that's fine to me. But I think there's a separation between operator and SDOD, right? Like you can you separate those, and the operator is optional, right? If you don't want to give a component running in your cluster that permission, you have the option to. Uh, operator running with super permission, it's already possible, you know, so, you know obviously right. since they are doing it, and so that's that's never a concern. I mean, it's uh... mm -hmm. okay. Um, so I think we need to follow up some more on this. Um, again, I still I, I I would like environments to take this on and try to try to lay out what this should all look like, yeah, sort of holistically rather than piecemeal, which we've been doing, where we're like we're fixing a piece here, fixing a piece there, but we don't have the whole picture. Was that something you all can take on? Um, and I think I think I think the whole like base install versus canary control plan install, right? Like all that ties into it too. So it'd be good to have kind of the whole picture. Okay. Um, John, you had a question if we can move the networking roadmap presentation. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize this till today. I, I won't be here next week. Um, so it may be good to swap with someone. Um, we could I mean, we're mostly ready. We're not in the spreadsheet. We're on a Google Doc, but we have all the content if we wanted to discuss it at all today. Um, but I won't be here next week. So I, I would, I think, prefer just in case people were planning on attending next week that aren't here today. Like, let's not do it today. Let's try to move it. Is there anyone from like user experience, environment, extension, telemetry, or security that is willing to swap for next week? 
UX is not ready. Costin's shaking his head no for environments. Not ready for security just, either. Okay. You just rocked uh, all the plans we had, so. Okay, so that okay, then I guess our question is either push it or or do it now. So maybe we should do it now. I don't know. What do people think? We could do it now. I mean, I, I suspect Neeraj will be quite interested, but he could also follow up. Yeah. Um, and I think Neeraj has been in the network meetings for the past few weeks, so he's probably already aware of everything. John, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes, I don't know if he reviewed it with the TOC lens, but he was he was there when we talked about it. Okay, then I think we should go ahead. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, do you have a, a doc or something, or do you want? To yeah, present? I'll add it to the chat and on the TOC doc in a second. Do you want to present, or do you want me to? Uh, you can you can go ahead and do it. There's okay. just one screen, so. And I, I will say it's like 95% complete, so we didn't fill in all the details on priorities and, and people yet, um, because <laughs> I didn't plan to present today. Uh, but we have the high-level stuff there. Um, so overall, this is is not much different from what we discussed in the 2021 roadmap and um, the 1.9 roadmap. A lot of this is long-term stuff that we've been working on for a while, and it's just continuation. Um, so we have our, I'll go a bit out of order. We have had CNI to beta um, for ever, basically. <laughs> uh, and we finally have owners, and they've already started the work as well. So like this is actually finally going to happen, I think. Um, so I think we'll actually promote CNI to beta this release, hopefully, or we'll at least get far closer than, than we have been before. Um, then the Gateway API. Um, once again, we're continuing the implementation of Kubernetes Gateway. Um, we've made a lot of progress. Um, some of the things we're going to work on now are especially support for mesh traffic. Um, so right now, we've mostly been focusing on ingress um, and to some extent egress. Um, other than that, just continuing to work with them on the API, make sure if it meets our needs, et cetera. Um, and oh yeah, also implementing gateway selection. Right now, we only support one Istio ingress gateway, so we want to make sure that we support arbitrary gateways, so you can have multiple of them, and that we write to the status fields, so they have things like, is this gateway ready? Is there conflicts? Is there uh, issues, etc. Um, so that's on. That's the plan for for this release for that. So John, are, are on that last one, the the Excuse complete you. design permission support part. Yep. Um, Basically, how, how's that going? Are, are you uh, making sure? Yeah, we've kind of gone back and forth, being stuck and not stuck. Um, I, I thought we were really close to getting consensus, but then there's some last minute disagreement. Um, we're so we're getting close, but we're not quite there yet. I think um, it's, okay. it's it's kind of tricky. So making making forward progress there. I, I think we are. Yeah. Okay. Let us know if that gets blocked because I think that's. You know that's important for the long term kind of APIs for Istio, right? So, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah to I'm, me, I'm, that's like the big hurdle we need to get over, and I I think we're close, but not quite there yet. Yeah, I, I, I'm spending a lot a lot of time in this then uh, to make okay. sure that we don't get blocked. Okay, um, I was gonna say it would be great to have a presentation, probably to, to TOC on this when we have kind of a plan that we're ready to talk about. I understand you guys aren't quite there yet, but. Once we have that sort of disseminating that information widely will be helpful. Yes, yeah. I, I agree. We've been working on it with the group of like six people so far that have been interested. And That's then we'll cool. probably expand that to the whole networking group and then TOC. OK. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, going back up to the top. Uh, so BTS, I. I'm not actually sure the actual details on this one, on what we're planning to do this release. Um, I, I didn't hear back from you, Chen, yet. Um, but I assume we are we're still planning to continue to work on that. Um, most of the work still is on the Envoy side, um, unless we get an owner to start doing some of the control plan work. Uh, 
Um, some of the other work, MCS to alpha. So Nate's been working on this a lot on when this is multi-cluster service discovery, the new Kubernetes API. Um, so we have a like full design out for how we're going to implement this, and we're making some progress there. So I think we'll probably have, I don't know if we'll actually make it to alpha or just experimental, uh, but I expect to have some support landed by this release. What are we, 1.11 now? Um, yeah, I don't have too much more to say there, but I we should probably have some more details there. So I'll see if I can get Nate to expand on that. Uh, the other one is Delta XDS. So this is mostly about performance optimization um, in general. Uh, we added experimental support in 1.10. It is very experimental. And so we're hoping to slowly uh, productionize that a bit. Um, so it, it works, but it does not work well at all. Um, well, it does work, but it's it's not meant to be efficient yeah. right now. It's meant to actually pass test. So uh, we're going to work on improving that. We have a, a pretty detailed roadmap on how we're going to incrementally uh, adopt this and not break everything. Um, so there's a lot of interest from various people here. So I expect we'll make a decent amount of progress on that. Um, I think some of these Rama and Zanku are people that are hitting these performance barriers, so they're they're pretty inclined to improve them. So. Uh, next one, IPv6 and dual stack. This is kind of like CMI. We've had it on the roadmap to stabilize for a very long time. Uh, we actually have owners now. They are actively working on this, um, Mirage and Jacob and some others at Aspen Mesh. Um, so I don't know exactly what end state will end up in 1.11, but we're certainly making progress here. Um, in particular, the dual stack support is non-existent right now. Um, in Istio, so we'll be adding that. And then in the process, we'll be improving the pure IPv6 support. Um, so right. for those not familiar, dual stack is new, or it's added to beta in, I think, 1.21 of Kubernetes. So. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think Kubernetes is starting to take this area more seriously. So it's good to see us sort of falling slowly, shortly behind them. It's basically yes, I, I agree, yeah. It's not a very trivial effort, so unfortunately, it will, it will probably be quite a quite a large effort. But I think we need to do it now that Kubernetes has it in beta. Uh, so that's pretty much the end of the the main ones, um, but, which is not indicated here in priorities, but in our discussion. Um, some of the other stuff with DNS proxying, um, we've had it around for I think two releases now, and generally been stable for VMs. Um, but we want to look into how we can actually improve it, especially around multi-cluster or multi-network stateful sets, um, some of those more tricky areas. We have kind of some support, but not necessarily where we want to be. So we want to continue to expand that. We also discussed long-term if we want to make this something yeah. that's enabled by default on Kubernetes. Um, for now, it's only enabled by default on VMs. Um, the tentative conclusion is that we, we don't want to do that for now, but we may in the future. And just the reason is the risk, because you know, there's a huge blast radius if we mess up the DNS in the cluster. So right now, we're not confident enough to, to turn that on yet. Um, the rest is just more minor stuff that wasn't didn't really warrant a whole, um, whole section, just some important, important bug fixes and minor features. Um, so there is like an issue about listener imbalances, how we can do some performance optimizations there. Um, Kubernetes has this new node local service API. Um, we need to figure out how that interacts with Istio and if we need to make any changes or support that. Um, we also, can, yeah, can, yeah. Can you, can you, can you, yeah, like that. I'm, what, what's, is that, is this already available, this API, or, or is it like coming or what? The service, the node local uh, service? Yeah, they have, it's like, I forget what it's called, service topology or something, or maybe that's the old one. Um, but I think it has like three values, like you can be node local or cluster local, or I thought there was a third, but I can't think of what it would be. Um, and it basically means keep the traffic only local to the node. Oh, I think it's node local only or node local preferred or cluster wide. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think it's an alpha API. So the idea here is we we may not even support it, but we need to figure out what we're going to do here. So a plan for a plan. Um, OK. Yeah, this is brand new. So it's not as urgent as some of the other stuff. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, some other things we discussed in the past about the single app listener work. 
um, consolidating all the listeners to one listener like we do with the inbound listener. Um, the main reason for doing that was because Envoy was deprecating the field that we relied on. Um, they've since undeprecated it, so we don't actually need to do it anymore. Um, we we may still investigate if there's other benefits of doing it, but it's not a high priority at all. This is probably like P3 or P4, um, so probably not, not even worth being on here. Um, it's more of what we won't do. Um, we also have a feature that we had an experimental for quite a while about scoping gateway clusters. So right now we send clusters for every single service to a gateway, which is a ton in a big cluster. Um, and you can't scope it down like you can with sidecars. Um, so we have this feature where we'll actually send only ones that are used by virtual services. Uh, but this has introduced various bugs. Um, so uh, if we can fix those bugs and turn on the optimization, that'd be a big win for users uh, transparently. And let's see. Yeah, I also talked about ex like progression of the import and export um, and how it may relate to MCS, which kind of has similar concepts in Gateway API. This is very vague because the idea is figure out what we want to do here. Um, we don't have anything more than <laughs> a vague statement for now, but I think there is definitely some improvements we can make here. Um, and finally, we have some egress improvements. Uh, to look into. Uh, right now, Eager's Gateway, I think, is a kind of a known clunky area of Istio. Um, so we have various ideas on how that could be improved, whether it's kind of having like the pass-through traffic go through the Eager's Gateway, yes. um, how we can better handle MTLS to the Eager's Gateway when we do SNI routing and wild SNI routing. I think it's meant to be wild card SNI routing uh, improvements, which currently doesn't work so well. Um, so this is kind of just like the whole section is just the crop bag of stuff that we may be interested in working on, but we don't really have things flushed out now, so they didn't make it to the top level. And at the bottom is kind of our dreams uh, that we <laughs> very unlikely will do, but we we are interested in them. So we need to just discuss them a bit. Yeah. What would uh, WebRTC support mean for Istio? Slightly, we're still pretty much uh, that a browser can talk with an application in cluster that is using WebRTC. But like, so we would implement it in Envoy, or what do you? No, no, just tunneling. There are some some uh, some tunneling concerns because they use turn and they have their own DTLS and and special uh, routing, and it's a bit tricky okay. to to have uh, you know go to where you want. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Anyone have any other comments on that? Uh, yeah, quick one. John, uh, do you expect any of these would break, uh, uh, introduce any backwards compatibility breaks? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Delta XDS, no, that should be transparent. IPv6, new feature. DNS proxying, if we do turn it on by default, which we don't plan to, that we'll have to look into what the behavior changes there. I don't know off the top of my head, but we're also not planning to do that in 111. Um, Gateway API, again, that's a new feature opt-in. CNI should be just improving things. So I don't think we're breaking anything, um, at least nothing that I know of, of yet, but we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, MCS, again, is new. So I would say mostly no. Um, it's mostly new features and stabilizing and transparently improving existing ones. So. Yeah, I wonder if any of the bug fixes might. What do you think? Um, I mean, nothing here obviously would. Certainly um, in the actual implementation, it, it could. But nothing here stands out as something that is inherently breaking change. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll allow any through egress gateways seems like it could if there wasn't a policy to control it. Oh, I think so, that would be yeah. opt-in, like API. Yeah. That you can say allow when it goes through egress. Yeah. Uh, any any requirements on the analyzers to relax their reporting or increase their reporting on anything? Uh, I mean, I think analyzer improvements are always welcome, but there's nothing that really stands out as, as new things we need. Um, one interesting interaction there is with the new gateway API. To some extent, they already have their own analysis. Um, you know, they have their own status fields, which are not just a blob of conditions that we can write used to conditions. Um, they have specific ones like, is this listener ready? 
and they have specific APIs that we're supposed to report for various issues like, no, this is not ready because it conflicts with another one. Um, and so we may need to sync up a bit on that. I don't think there's too much to do other than understand that we will implement that API, of course, and that um, it's not just writing Istio specific status anymore. Uh, yeah. one, one quick question on, on, on Josh's uh, comment earlier. BTS has the potential long term to be a major incompatibility when, but I mean, for a few releases, we'll keep all BTS and the old uh, system. But at some point, you know, we want BTS to be the default and, and the old one to be deprecated. Well, why would that Why would that introduce a backwards compatibility? BTS is a pretty different protocol. I mean, it's it's uh, you know mm. the traffic between workloads is going to go over over BTS with uh, you know different tunneling, different metadata. The hacky proton uh, that we prepend on top of TCP connections will replace with proper BTS. No, I, I get, but why would why would that actually be exposed as a backwards compatibility break for the user? Uh, because because at some point, if we if we want to stop uh, the current protocol. Uh, you will have, I mean, we, we will keep both for a while, but it's a pretty high yeah. cost on, in terms of. Uh, right. It's, but, a but I think that... it's a new proxy, right? Like it would not impact a user that's just upgrading one version at a time and does the yeah. happy path, but it wouldn't yeah. impact right. someone that has like an Istio 1.4 sitting around and connects to it. Yeah, at, at some point when, when we stop the head keeping both, uh, 1.4 will no longer be able to talk with 120. Right. So there, there might be some sort of, what it might do is it might constrain their upgrade path. Yes. Where at some point, you know, there there are a series of releases, and it might be like you know, one eleven through one thirteen or something, where you can actually use both simultaneously, and you would have to hit one of those releases on your way to upgrading to something yep. you know higher than one thirteen. Okay. Yeah, or for clients that are non Istio clients but are still <laughs> managing to speak Istio MTLS. Uh, and 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 that's actually a very big important issue on on, on you know interoperability with other uh, other systems. GRPC although that's, yeah, although that's quite different here because nobody speaks as to MTLS. Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> but with BTS, they will speak. So with BTS, yes, B -B -B BTS they could speak, yes, because it is a standard yeah. or close to it. So we, we had better be sure BTS works really well <laughs> before we switch to it. Uh, really, mask is a standard, but I mean, BTS is yes. a, you know kind of degraded form of mask, uh, you know, over H2 instead of H3. So that's so. So as a, uh, w what is what is the current state like? Can 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 we try it out? Can we try out parts of it? What's the what's the yes. status of BTS right now? Uh, it's mostly implemented on the voice side, as far as I know. So we just need to tweak configurations and to to roll it in production, and it's not. Uh, we don't miss any any piece as far as I know in terms of uh, you know upgrading a TL, TCP connection to H2 and and I know other products that are using this feature. So it's it's testable. I think there's still some debate in Envoy about whether the implementation is the right way to implement it, and so there's some debate about changing that. Um, so right now it's it's testable, but there's still a way to go. I think before it's shippable. But okay. at this protocol level, I mean, the concept of TCP over H2, H3, uh, you know, it's, it's relatively well established and it will not change. I mean, the implementation obviously will change many times. That's not the same as well. Not the protocol and external view. Yes, the, the protocol, I mean, there's still some debate about header semantics, but yeah, it, that part is mostly stable because it's a standard. How is it? A, how is it accessible right now? Is it a branch then? If no, we it's just to envoy filter, and you put some, uh, uh, you know, you use any features basically. Okay, so so we so I, I think we, we need to sync with you Chen and or Taylor to to get some real details. So so that we can start testing using it, and there is there is a related telemetry item of what do we do and i think now we are much closer to actually moving on that than we were before yeah. that that's the reason for for my questions yeah i think yu chen is writing up some instructions for people to manually configure envoys to test things okay great but yeah we, we still have some protocol like some some next level detail in the protocol to work through 
So one comment regarding multi-cluster uh, service to Alpha. So I think that's probably going to have some backwards compatible and migration issues for a user. I'd assume today user would be using cluster local or using that global and Envoy filter to kind of config which services they are going to be consumed um, within the local cluster and which services they are exposing to um, outside of the cluster for other clusters to consume. So there would be semantics changes for the user if they move in to consume this new API. Yeah, so I think the goal is to keep everything, they don't choose to use it, everything works as it does today, so there's no breakage. But if they do choose to use it, there's a whole migration to MCS. Yeah, I agree. Control. So it will be opt-in, I guess, when only when they have that customer resource. Yeah. So then I think the question is going to be how long we need to keep right the current way around. All right, kind of like with um with the whatever we're talking about right here, I forget which part. <laughs> the new APIs. New API. Anytime we have a new API, right? Like anytime we have a new way of doing something. Yeah, BTS, right? So like we gotta keep the old stuff around for a while. And I think there's going to come a time when we start discussing when can we deprecate and remove old stuff. Yes, is, is there an interaction between? Uh, I assume there's an interaction between MCS and canonical service. Then. Uh, no, no, there's there isn't one today. But there should be, right? Uh, well, despite the name, you know, canonical services workload workload group concept more. Um, there, there's today they don't they don't relate at all. They're completely independent. Today, so what what kind of interaction were you thinking of? So, if, if a multi cluster service is the global name of a service, and and the workload's job is to pri primarily fulfill that contract in any one cluster, what name would we want the canonical? name to be the cluster dot local one or the dot global one so the the mcs names are kind of like kubernetes service names they're actually addresses they're not they're not the same concept as canonical service that's why i was sure it's, you know it's it, it's different enough that actually like we don't use uh in canonical service we don't actually use service names at all to drive to drive things it's based on labels it's not based on service names Although we used to backfill, right? We do. We don't use service at all to backfill. Okay. So we we were using app name or something like that to backfill. Yeah. Yeah. So and, I think they stay independent. Yeah, and there is a discussion about how to to harmonize this with service accounts and uh, species identities and. Uh, you know, yeah, I I owe a I owe a doc. I will have a doc for next week's TSC on that topic. Okay. All right, I think we are at time. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation, John. Seems to make sense to me. Uh, yeah, are, are there? Uh, I, I guess we didn't get a chance to ask about staffing, but you 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 you've listed out what's staffed and what's explicitly staffed and what's not explicitly staffed. I guess. I, I would say let's have networking just share us. You know, a. a Share a doc or something with TSC. We don't have to re-review it, but that we can review offline with the details once they're finalized. The priorities, then names. Yeah, sounds good. I'll put it into that spreadsheet we have. Uh, yeah, and okay. then I'll we'll, the gaps will be obvious there. But most of the, the main ones we we do have staff, so I'm not too concerned. All right, I think people, people need to run to other meetings. So thank you all. See you guys. Have a good week. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.